Hi everyone, welcome to our May 14th, 2015 Department Safety Coordinator meeting. We are going to go ahead and get started. My name is Jeanette De La Rosa Ducat and I will be leading the call for today. Um, on our agenda, uh, we are planning to talk today about um, just a, a whole set of different things. We're going to summarize, we will be summarizing our previous meetings. We'll also be discussing records management, which is an IIPP responsibility. Um, we'll also be going over environmental programs, which is our agent featured program of the month. Um, and Bayway 2 will be discussing our injury prevention topic of the month, which is abrasions and bites. We'll also be going over some latest news involving the Camp Safety Committee. Um, a recent report from our DSC program evaluation survey that we had conducted about a month and a half ago. And then just wanted to reiterate, there's a meeting change for June. It won't be held this first Thursday of the month, which is what we're used to. It'll be held just like today during the second Thursday of the month. And then we'll have an open forum at the end of the meeting. So um, just wanted to again introduce who's on the call today. Um, myself, Jeanette Ducat. I am um, the UC Training and Education Manager, and I'll be I'm leading the Department Safety Coordinator Program. Um, by the way, I'll be leading that up until August, and it will be transitioned to Bayway Two, who is also going to be joining us on the line. Bayway Two is the injury, I'm sorry, is a Safety and Industrial Hygiene Program Manager, and she today will be discussing abrasions and bites, which is our injury prevention topic of the month, and. We also have Amanda Gray who will be discussing or providing an overview of environmental programs and how that affects the Department of Safety Coordinators. She actually had previously recorded her presentation, so that's a short 12-minute presentation I'll, we'll be sharing with you today. Um, so those are the um, team members that are sharing today. Now last meeting we talked about injury reports, which is an IIPP responsibility. We also discussed the each and featured programs of PPE or personal protective equipment and hazard communication, which involves chemicals. We also talked about um, the injuries known as struck by or an, an object or person. Um, and we had some latest news that we shared involving the Campus Safety Committee meeting. We shared that, like, so for example, today's meeting would be the second Thursday of the month, not the first, which is what we normally use. Um, what we normally do. And then we also introduced that there was a BAS or Business Administrative Services Client Satisfaction Survey. Um, so today we're, we're, today we're going to talk about records management. Records management is an item in the Injury and Illness Prevention Plan that Department Safety Coordinators are responsible for, um, along with others. To give you an idea of some of the things to be included and, and managed um, in terms of records, you can log into our website, which is ehs.ucr.edu slash safety slash DSC. And once you log in, um, there's a button on the bottom that you can click on that says records. And once you click on that records button, it'll take you to a list of forms that perhaps you can maintain and or the supervisor can maintain. And each of these forms are links to different things that we've gone over in the past couple of meetings. So again, records management is a very, very important um, aspect of a department safety coordinator. Um, and so I've provided a lot of those things that you want to include in a perhaps a central binder um, through that website um, for maintaining records, which is again through our DSC um, website and under click uh, under maintain records this button on the bottom that you can click on um, and again you can bring that all up later on so just to make sure it's um, in a visual sense you can get a set, uh, understanding of what we're hoping you would do it's generally a good idea to create some kind of a centralized repository like a safety binder a safety manual or a safety binder and it doesn't have to be a binder it could be a filing cabinet with these records but generally if you do um, collect records, you want to put in them these things that we've talked about in the past. And so that includes a copy of your department's injury and illness prevention plan. We mentioned in previous meetings that this is a document you can request to be customized from eh &S. If you go to our website under forms, there's a request form that we can help you create this plan. So you have that in your, in your centralized location. You also want to have in there um, training records. And so we talked 
a couple, or actually our first meeting, we talked about having on hand some kind of records of training, such as the training plan you might have developed for each individual in your department or any rosters that you guys had collected. Um, hopefully, forwarded those rosters to each and as training so that they can be entered into the UC Learning Center. But the originals and any other kind of sign-offs of perhaps um, orientation documents or checklists, that's all something you want to keep together in the safety manual or the safety um, records keeping. So your IIPP, anything related to training, and really anything related to communications, which includes if you ever have a uh, meeting, a meeting where you talk about safety, such as a safety meeting or even a staff meeting where safety is an item on your agenda, you want to have on hand, perhaps in your safety manual, not just the IIPP and not just training records, but um, copies of your sign-in sheets or the rosters where people completed, uh, showing that they've attended these meetings. And so if ever something comes up where you're wondering um, whether people were exposed to any particular item or safety topic, you can have in the central binder a copy of the sign-in sheet showing that they were there and perhaps a copy of the agenda discussing what went over and what you guys went through during the meeting, along with any rosters of trainings that you had gone over. So again, in your safety manual, this is a records management topic we're talking about, have your IIPP, any training records, any sign-in sheets where you ever talked about safety, even if it's a staff meeting sign-in sheet. Um, you also want to have ready um, any inspections you've conducted. And so a couple of weeks, I'm sorry, a couple of meetings ago, we had gone over the IIPP responsibility of inspections. We shared a few checklists available for different areas from office office areas to facilities areas to material handling to even laboratory safety areas. And so those inspection checklists that you performed, it's a good idea to keep them all together with your IPP and your training records and your meeting sign-in sheets where you talk about safety, um, just so it's centralized. And last but not least, if you ever do have the unfortunate um, luck of having an accident or an incident in your department, you're normally supposed to complete what we talked about last month, um, an injury report. Um, and that injury report, in, on the back side of that injury report that we, usually comes from human resources or, or workers' compensation, has um, um, a form for uh, documenting your investigation of the incident or the accident. This includes not just the, the description, but a root cause as well as a preventive action plan for every root cause. So. We talked about that last month. So you want to put this document or documents like this together with any inspections, any training, any sign-in sheets for meetings, and, and your copy of your department's injury and illness prevention plan all, all together in your safety manual. So um, I, there's some more things you might want to keep it, but at its least, these are the documents that um, you and your departments are able to control and manage that aren't necessarily always maintained by other departments, not always uh, accessible, for example, from EHNS, because these are things that you guys kind of put together. So um, your safety manual is your central repository for a variety of documents. Um, I bring this up because um, when there ever there is an inspection, um, that's an example of the accident <laughs> incident investigation report, Whenever there is an incident, and if it's a major incident, um, major enough such that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration will um, come by and attend and, um, and investigate our, our campus, they will ask for several documents. Some of these documents, and this, the, the documents that they request um, will come in a written format, um, like what you see here. And so some of these documents that are checked on this form may not necessarily be the ones being requested at the time that they come along and ask you for information, but um, I will go over a couple of examples of what might be applicable. And a lot of it, a lot of these examples are things that I just shared you um, and recommend that you have in your central binders. So if you can give me a moment, I will bring up this particular example. This was a real document request sheet we obtained about a couple of weeks ago from California Occupational Safety and Industrial Hygiene, um, or OSHA. And so um, I, I will spare you the details, but in essence, they asked for, in particular, um, 
And because it was involving an accident or an injury, they described the afferent the description of the incident, as well as our incident investigation report form, including maybe any photographs of the incident. Now, both of these things can be contained on that same document that we talked about last month, which is the injury report, and on in the back of that injury report, the incident investigation form. They also asked for, I mean, other things that actually in this example apply more to a laboratory, such as layout to the laboratory, list of personal protective equipment, list of chemicals, any list of procedures and training requirements and hazard analysis. And so I won't um, go over that. However, they also asked for things that you might want to keep in your binder as well, which is any standard operating procedures for the work task that folks perform um, so that if somebody was injured and is a victim of an injury that um, we can show um, and document any kind of rules <laughs> or procedures that they should have been following. And um, uh, a facility layout, which is generally what we refer to as campus map, but we also have um, floor layouts um, there that are available through the facilities management system or FMS. So OSHA asked for that. They asked for SOPs, a facility layout, and again, here they asked for injury and illness incident report. Our, um, this is more of a campus-based report form, and so this is actually this one and the employer's first report of injury and the doctor's. These forms actually are available from both human resources and you can actually contact um, EHNS as well if you are looking for that because it's being asked for. But look what else they asked for. They asked for the Injury and Illness Prevention Program. And that's why I mentioned earlier that you want to have a copy of your IIPP document um, in your binders or in somewhere centralized. Um, and again, that's a full plan that you can request from each nest to be customized. And here again, they ask um, for training, safety, health and safety training records, which is an, in addition to the accident investigation report form. There are other documents that we can help you um, help provide to you if it's being asked for, such as an emergency action plan or the campus fire prevention plan or the campus hazard communication plan. But for the most part, those things that I've highlighted are things that are under the control of the department. Um, and by the way, they might also ask for any kind of supervisory contact information as well as any DSC contact information or union representative information for those involved that are um, represented by a collective bargaining unit. So um, all of, a lot of this stuff, um, it can be requested from Cal OSHA. There's just that potential. And so I always um, recommend that you centralize it in a binder or in a filing cabinet and that it's available to other people. Because can you imagine if you weren't there as a department safety coordinator, but an agency came in on that week or day that you weren't available, um, what your coworkers would have to do to collect all this information. If you had it already centralized in a binder, it would be easy just to say, hey, if they're asking for anything related to safety, just check out the binder that's on top of my desk or under my drawer or what, wherever you may keep it. Um, and that's why it's good to have this all prepared ahead of time. Because it can be daunting when you requested a bunch of documents to have to try to get them together at the last minute. It's much more preferable if you have it all centralized in a safety manual or a binder or a filing cabinet that people knew where it was or had access to it. So again, put in your safety manuals or your IIPP, any training records, any sign-in sheets for safety meetings or meetings where you talked about safety, copy of any inspections, as well as if there are incidents, um, any injury investigation report, as well as the accident investigation report that came along with that. So in summary, because it's on our checklist of the top 10 safety actions for supervisors, I. Um, recommend that you keep a central file and in specific, specifically in this file, maintain the injury, the IPP, any training and communications rosters or sign-in sheets, any inspections and the ways that you corrected the hazards during inspections, um, hazard reports and investigations of injuries and incidents. Those are the items you at minimum want to have together um, when you manage records in one central file. So. Um, that being said, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is to talk about the EHNS featured program of the month, which happens to be environmental programs. For today's meeting, we um, will be listening to the presentation provided by Amanda Gray. Amanda um, had to be taken to a last minute um, training, and so uh, she previously recorded this actually just yesterday. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this presentation. 
and um, if you have any questions, we'll talk about it afterward. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amanda Gray, and I'm the Environmental Program Manager here at Environmental Health and Safety. And today I'm going to give us a brief overview of environmental programs. We uh, cover compliance for programs that involve hazardous waste, hazardous materials, and air quality, water quality, and remediation. Our team members, you, you may or may not have had opportunity to work with, uh, we generally work with people that have labs in the science departments or departments that have various technical areas. Um, our team members are Kelly Winters, he's a hazardous materials specialist. Richard Watson is the hazardous waste specialist. And Travis Underwood is the environmental program specialist and he supports both hazardous materials and hazardous waste operations, and he also supports uh, various other environmental programs areas. What is environmental programs? Environmental programs is an advisory uh, group that provides information and guidance to ensure campus compliance with various environmental and hazardous materials regulations. The biggest and most significant environmental aspect on our campus is hazardous waste. And the various types of hazardous waste that we generate on campus are chemical waste, radioactive waste, and biohazardous waste. And with the new School of Medicine, we'll be generating more and more medical waste on campus. Environmental programs also takes care of air permitting for uh, combustion type equipment. We do uh, health risk assessments. We do various types of compliance uh, monitoring and reporting to South Coast Air Quality Management District and the California Air Resources Board. We do stormwater pollution prevention work related to a relatively new stormwater permit. It's a statewide general permit. It's called the Phase Two Small MS4 permit. Some of you may or may not be familiar with that type of a permit. UC Riverside was recently designated as a non-traditional permittee under that Phase Two Small MS4 permit. And over the next few years, much of the campus community will be hearing more and more about stormwater pollution prevention uh, because that phase too small uh, permit requires a public education and outreach program. So if we're successful, everyone will be hearing more and more about stormwater pollution prevention on campus. Uh, environmental programs also is responsible for a sewer system overflow reduction program that is basically um, implemented through a sanitary sewer management plan. Environmental programs also provides information and guidance on an oil storage spill prevention uh, program that is implemented through a spill prevention control and countermeasures plan. There's a lot of oil storage on campus. Most of it is uh, in these uh, emergency generator engine fuel storage tanks. Um, some of you might be familiar with these emergency generator equipment sets that you see around campus. Uh, there, Some of them are in these uh, chain link fence enclosures. Some of them are outside of buildings in their own sort of enclosures that are incorporated into the buildings. Some of them are in mechanical spaces in the buildings. Some of them are on, on uh, mobile portable trailer type setups that you might see. Um, around the campus from time to time. And then we also have a lot of oil storage in, in elevators. That's uh, hydraulic fluid that's in elevators. So we have a lot of oil storage on campus and it's, uh, it's a federal law and it's quite a big plan. And uh, this plan and the sanitary sewer uh, management plan and the Phase two MS4 permit and related documentation are all available on our, envi our environmental programs webpage, and that's a, a subpage of the ehs.ucr.edu webpage. The uh, environmental programs also provides information and guidance to promote uh, IPM methods, which is integrated pest management methods. These are chemical free methods or reduced risk pesticides for use to um, 
uh, rely on uh, lower toxic or chemical-free methods to manage pests on campus, um, both outdoors and indoors. Environmental programs also provides information and guidance to ensure compliance with certain hazardous materials regulations. Uh, one uh, of these that you may be familiar with is the Hazardous Materials Emergency Business Plan. Uh, it requires a chemical inventory, and many of you may have had some exposure to uh, using the chemical inventory. Um, hazardous Materials Emergency Business Plan regulations also require site maps, emergency planning, and employee training. Uh, hazardous materials program within environmental programs also works with the controlled substances regulations here on campus. And there's chemical facility anti-terrorism standards that are part of homeland security regulations. Hazardous materials and hazardous waste are, and also oil storage, um, need support from environmental programs for emergency response and cleanup. And uh, our department, with um, participation from the entire Environmental Health and Safety Department, provides uh, that emergency response and cleanup support. Environmental programs also provide support for remediation sites on campus. There's one uh, large site over in agricultural operations that has already been uh, cleaned up and closed, but there's ongoing operation and maintenance and oversight for that site. It's called the former pesticide waste pit site. And environmental programs will also provide guidance and oversight to support closure and removal of underground storage tanks from time to time and other types of cleanup that might be required on campus. What services that environmental programs provide can DSCs take advantage of? Um, the primary service that environmental programs provides is the Waste E Online Hazardous uh, Waste Management application. If you or any of your departments uh, generate hazardous waste, you can use the Waste E Online application to create labels, they're commonly called tags, and, and uh, request pickup for hazardous waste using this online application. You can log in with your UCR Net ID at the website here shown uh, on the screen. And it's very easy to use. And uh, actually, this is the ideal way to manage hazardous waste on campus. It tracks all the waste. We can use it to generate all sorts of reports. And it's a, a, a way to create a, a legally compliant hazardous waste label. Environmental programs can provide hazardous material for storage guidance. We can provide guidance on managing hazardous waste, how to store it properly, uh, accumulation guidelines. Uh, we can provide information on stormwater pollution prevention as part of the uh, education and public outreach uh, component, or best management practices for source control um, for stormwater pollution prevention. We can provide information on integrated pest management methods and practices, not only for um, campus operations, but also for um, home management of pesticides and pest management, you know, how to reduce the use of pesticides and how to manage pests in it with uh, chemical-free methods. You can view our environmental program's website information at ahs.ucr.edu slash environmental programs. And as I mentioned before, there's information on the website about all of our programs. You can view our SPCC plan, our sanitary sewer management plan, uh, documents related to the Phase 2 MS4 stormwater permit. The current integrated pest management plan is there. Uh, we have uh, air quality updates there. We have a link to the South Coast Air Quality Management District um, daily air quality index is there and the air quality map there. Uh, you can look at um, the current air quality index at the South Coast Air Quality Management District website. There's a link there you can click on and it'll give you the uh, hourly air quality index. So there's some information there you might be interested in. How can DSC support environmental programs? You can help us by providing information about your department operations. You can let us know how we can help you. And you can also contact us if you observe a hazardous materials issue 
or a potential environmental issue such as evidence of leak or spill, whether that's indoor in your technical areas or indoor or outdoor, if you observe a sanitary sewer overflow or if you observe a non-stormwater discharge, which is more commonly called you know, dry weather flow. For instance, if you see uh, water running down the street somewhere and it's not raining, you know, that's not uh, normal. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to investigate that and see whether that's coming from a leaky sprinkler or whether that might be some problem with water main or that might be some other problem. It could be a sanitary sewer overflow, which is uh, critical uh, that it's dealt with immediately. And also on the environmental program's webpage, there's a very interesting um, a set of photographs there showing exactly what a sanitary sewer overflow looks like. Uh, you may not have ever seen, you know, what that looks like. And so there's an interesting set of photographs there so you can see exactly what that is and you'd be able to recognize uh, that if you saw one on campus. And also there's instructions there on how you can report sanitary sewer overflow or really anything that you might see, evidence of leak or spill, non-storm water discharge, which you want to do is you want to call physical plant, um, service desk and there's instructions there on the website or you can call uh, the UC Police Department. They have instructions there who to call in case of sanitary sewer overflow or if you saw evidence of chemical leak or spill, anything like that. You can call me at extension 22416 or reach me at my email amanda.gray at ucr.edu. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not here today to answer your questions, but I'm always available at my extension or at my web address. Thank you very much. So that was Amanda's wonderful presentation on environmental program. Again, if you have any questions for her, please feel free to contact her. Her extension is 2416. Again, 2416. Um, with that, we are going to move on to our next topic of the day. Um, Good morning, everyone. Oh, My name sorry. is Amanda Gray, and I'm the environmental oh, program. I replayed her presentation by accident. But anyway, um, we are going to go ahead and move on to abrasions or bites, which is the injury prevention topic of the month. And so Beiwei, too, should be presenting that um, uh, injury topic. And Beiwei, I've just given you control. If you can go ahead and click on Quick Start in the upper left-hand corner and then share your screen. You are now, you should be able to begin your presentation. Thanks, Bailey. It's coming up. Go ahead. And I'm sorry, we don't hear you, so make sure that you, when you begin talking, um, unmute your phone. Okay. Um, Thanks, Bailey. Uh, all right, um, today I'm going to talk about two um, topics that kind of both relied on bite. Uh, we talk about um, cut and puncture wounds at uh, previous meeting, so I, I will just skip the abrasion side. We will focus on the bite side. Typically, the do you see the you know the bigger screen or my PowerPoint control screen, Jeanette? All right, we see your bee sting prevention treatment, the slideshow. Okay. You're good Great. Right. Um, based on our injury history, most of our um, insect bites are related to bee sting. Typically, um, they are people work outdoors, our groundkeepers, people in egg ops, maintenance folks. They are several tips we have for bee sting prevention. First of all, um, you know, obviously you need to be aware of the surrounding. Um, you know, we have quite a few areas. We have, you know, little wasp net or, you know, beehives. And uh, when we are working around those areas, special precaution needs to be taken. And in general, if you work outdoors, potentially there is bee nearby. We recommend you wear light color, smooth finish clothing because be kind of like uh, to attack objects with darker colors because kind of simulate uh, their predators, for example, bear. 
And also, you want to avoid to use uh, perfume, soap, shampoo, or deodorants which have some kind of fragrance attract those beans. And uh, also, sweat make bees angry. So have uh, clean clothes, have daily baths help you to prevent bees to attack you. And if you have to work in areas bees flying around, obviously you want to cover as much as possible. And if you don't have to go to the flower areas with a lot of bees, obviously that's a good choice. If we can keep the work area clean, for example, if you have fruit, all those things, those attract wasps and you can come and uh, attack uh, people. Um, if you have bees already start attacking, obviously we want to get away from the bees. And one thing to keep in mind is jumping into water is not the best choice. Especially uh, Africanized honeybees, they will fly above the water. Whenever you surface, they will start the sun again. If the bee come into the vehicle, you know, obviously you want to stay calm, don't panic, slow down, and, you know, park the car, then open all the windows. And if you have a history of allergic reaction to bees, uh, it's a good idea, you know, to have your medical bracelet or jewelry with you so whenever people and uh, call the emergency service, they know, you know, what exactly going on and have an EpiPen is the other good practice. Just in case you get bee stung and, uh, you know, if this is what you have, you know, a little bit of pain, so redness, swelling, no big deal. Sometimes you even have mild headache. All these not a serious situation. However, if you have, a, um, you know, some allergic reaction, serious allergic reaction, then that's a medical, emergency medical condition. What we can do is very simple for the local reaction. You know, you want to make sure, uh, wash the site uh, with uh, soapy water, and uh, we want to remove the um, stinger because, uh, you know, if it's still there in the next few seconds, it can still release chemical into the skin and cause the reaction get worse. One thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, you want to um, take it out e either with a gauze or you want to scrape uh, a fingernail over the area. You can also apply ice to reduce swelling. And uh, for pain, typical painkiller would be fine. And uh, for mild um, allergic reaction, you know, those allergy pills, Benadryl, uh, you know, antihistamine will work for the situation. We mentioned it earlier, if you have a severe allergic reaction, this is a medical emergency. When we talk about severe um, allergy reaction is like um, things, uh, you cannot breathe, they are swelling, not just in the local area, it expands to the face and neck, all those is a medical emergency. That's what we have for the bee sting. Let's move on to uh, another one, snake bite. You know, summer's coming and snakes start to come out. Come out here during the summer. Once in a while, we um, we had phone calls. People talk about uh, snake sighting around campus. So, how what can we do to prevent snake bite? And what needs to be done to prevent snake bite? You know, this is just uh, an example, one of the snakes in this general area. There are more than 30 different uh, species of snakes in California. However, only 10 of them are venomous. You know, those are poison snakes, and all of them are rattlesnakes. This is one of them is uh, some Pacific rattlesnake. And we actually saw this one near EHS last year a few times, uh, red diamond bag. And this is a native species. And we, once in a while, we see it even in our yard, uh, the gopher snake. But the gopher snake sometimes was um, confused with rattlesnake, but it's not poison. These are some other snakes we typically see in California, and particularly in Riverside. So what can we do to prevent snake bite? Typically, if you see, see a snake, you leave it alone. They don't really just go jump on you uh, and attack. 
stay in a safe distance is very important. Once a while, we see a snake, then we have our students, our people, and uh, start to take photos, get pretty close to the snake. That's not a good choice. Typically, snake can strike at the distance half of its body length. So if we stay further away from that distance, we are generally safe. Um, sometimes we have our staff and uh, students call 911 and our police or even our ground service when they see a, sn a snake sighting. A lot of times when, let's say, our ground people respond or um, animal control people respond, then the snake's gone. So leave it alone is typically the best choice. Just a sidebar note, uh, unless the snake is in a cage, Animal control typically would not respond to the call because of the same reason. When they come, snake's already gone. Unless you have a proper training, do not handle snake because you need the special gears, for example, the legging uh, snake boots and the hooks to actually um, safely handle snake. And just be aware of the surrounding is also very important. And if you go out at night, it's recommended to have a flashlight. A lot of these are common sense, but we just need some kind of reminder once in a while. If you get a snake bite, these are the symptoms. And actually, there are a lot of different symptoms. Sometimes it show up as a combination, and it's very rare you only have one symptom. So what can you do once uh, you know you have a snake bite? Snake bite typically will cause swelling. So you want to remove from rings and jewelry to you know actually further down the road once the swelling you can get it off anyway. And don't panic. Typically snake bite is not fatal. We have antivenom. So and as long as you can get to a hospital with ventanil, antivenin, and uh, more than likely you'll be fine. More people die of bee sting than snake bite. Um, when we transport people to uh, the hospital because of snake bite, these are what we need to have in mind. Um, one of the hospital nearby actually is well known for, for to treat snake bite. That's Loma Linda. So we are very fortunate to have something, you know, very close to us. And don't make the patient walk. You know, this, uh, we don't want uh, the venom go all over the people. And uh, when we transport them, try to make them in a recovery position. When we are talking about recovery position, this is what we are talking about. The reason we would like to people in recovery position is because uh, if they throw up, you know, vomit, and this is a position, we can prevent them from getting choke, choke on those um, uh, vomit. And a lot of times, you know, it's not just the uh, toxic effects from venom, people are in shock, and in shock typically put burden on people's body, and this is uh, what we need to look out for. The sign of shock uh, include pale, you know, sweaty, they kind of sleepy, not conscious, or no pulse or very weak pulse on the wrist. And a typical antivenom therapy is called Crofab. It is something very expensive. So try not to get bite by a snake is very important. The other thing to keep in mind is do not try some of the um, kind of common no technique for snake bite say, hey, cut the snake bite uh, wouldn't help, and suck the, um, you know, the, all those blood out doesn't help either. And in this case, you don't want to use ice. Bee sting, yes, we recommend you use ice, but snake bite, no. 
and uh, some people go to the extreme on electrical shock. Actually, it makes it worse. It doesn't help with the situation at all. And those snake bite kits doesn't work. And we don't recommend you take those painkillers, aspirin, ibuprofen, and alcohol, because all those situations in the blood and it doesn't prevent it getting getting worse. So that's pretty much what I have for bee sting and snake bite. We will take questions at the end of this meeting. Oh, actually, I have one one more thing. Um, I want I uh, because I relate to uh, Janessa. Uh, um, talk earlier because we have a question come from um, one of the attendees. How do I get um, how do I get uh, injury illness prevention program uh, from EHS? You can go to the EHS website and IAPP section, and here we have a request for injury and illness prevention. Um, plan, and uh, after you fill in a survey, we will email you the um, departmental specific IAPP. That's all the information we need from you for the IAPP development. Thanks, Beiwei. I'm so sorry. I had to step away for a while. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so are you complete with your presentation? I'm done, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and again, the way it was presenting abrasions or bites or injury prevention topic of the month, we tend to present those things that um, that we've received uh, um, reports from or, or, or trends and in, uh, injury injuries from over the past few years. Now we're going to go ahead and finish up our phone call or conference to talk about um, our final topics. As a reminder, there's a Campus Safety Committee meeting every month. The next one will be held next week, next Thursday at 1.30 p.m., and it will be held at Hinder Rocker in the basement, room 154. So if you're ever going down to Hinder Rocker, there's a set of stairs. It's um, right out the stairs or right out the elevator on your left-hand side. Um, I've also um, wanted to share that the meeting for June has been moved. Instead of being the first Thursday of the month, it will be the second Thursday of the month. And that brings us to June 11th, 2015. So again, next month, we won't be meeting on the first Thursday, but the second Thursday. And I'll make sure to send out an email about that. Finally, one of the things we did um, a couple months ago was we did a program um, evaluation survey. I had asked um, if we um, all the department safety coordinators would fill out a survey. Um, in fact, let me see if I can bring it up right now. <laughs> in that survey, uh, asked some particular questions around what people thought was their overall reaction to the Department Safety Coordinator Program, um, whether it impacted their behavior in, in coordinating safety in their department, and how effective it was against three measurements. And then we also asked about some feedback about things that they liked and did not like, and some comments. And so I was going to go over very briefly the results of this report. Beginning first um, with something that wasn't necessarily on the survey, but shows kind of our, our participation rate in the program in general. Um, um, I've had data that I was able to track back to 2010. And um, last year was when we really um, did a bit more effort in changing up the program and making sure that we had the right name of department safety coordinators for every department. And so it seems that the assignments have been sticking with us since last year at 96%, meaning that 96% of the departments on campus have assigned a department safety coordinator. And the few, four or five, who don't have um, department safety coordinators are because they are either in a transition between hiring or um, were, um, they were brand new departments, actually, that were formed and we're still waiting for it to be staffed. Um, so another question asked on the survey was, what is your overall reaction to this program? And so we were able to get that a majority of folks, at least 72% of individuals who completed the survey, said that the program was either good or very good. And so that's very um, inspiring. <laughs> it shows us that we're doing a few things uh, in such a way that are acceptable to folks um, in, the, in the program. And then we had asked whether um, you thought that the program affected the way that you do your work. Um, 
particularly whether you thought it impacted your behavior. And so we got a few that disagreed or um, strongly disagreed with the statement, but for the most part, um, um, majority of folks, uh, at least 59% of the reported changes in behavior were attributed to the program. And then, then we asked a series of questions that looked at three separate metrics. One of them is was integrity, or what we refer to as the business and administrative services goals and vision and mission for the organizational unit under which this program falls under. In particular, um, that program is interested in um, people and processes and resources and customer needs. We also wanted to know whether we, through this Department Safety Coordinator program through our meetings, are teaching anything related to um, you know, um, skill or knowledge development and or if we are um, helping improve safety culture as defined by your beliefs, values, or behavior um, changes um, geared towards safety. So with the first one where we were looking at um, whether the program helped um, you as a person or helped you improve your processes or resources or customer service needs, we found that we did really good when it came to, when it came to um, helping you as a person and that we can certainly improve um, how the program affects your processes or provides you with the resources that you need to function as a department safety coordinator and or whether we are responding to your needs as a client or a customer. Um, another um, aspect that we looked at that seems to go very well was that it seems that our program is do doing a really good job of in teaching or encouraging learning. We have increased a good amount of awareness about the agents programs through our web conferences, also about the injury prevention topics of the month. Um, that there seems to be a little bit more knowledge about how to prevent those injuries from recurring. We also try to share our latest news on, that are happening on campus, not just related to our program, but, but also just general incidents, uh, in, uh, things happening at UCR. And we've also seemed to do um, a good enough job in raising awareness about the IIPP, or the Injury and Illness Prevention Plan. So I'm going to have a couple more, one more metric to go over, and that is, do you, as a department safety coordinator, um, think that as a result of the program, you now believe in safety or value safety or perform safe more safely? And so it seems that the program has um, certainly attributed, it is attributed to a good, a common belief and value and performance towards improving safety culture. So that was some really good feedback that we are impacting the safety culture in some way through this department safety coordinator program. And finally, and this is really important, is that we asked an uh, open-ended question around what people liked and did not like the least or did not like the most out of our program. Um, there were a couple of folks who said that the time required to implement the responsibilities was not preferable and that a lot of our topics were too focused on laboratories. In fact, folks said that they would rather have topics focused on office, office areas. So we're going to try to do that a lot more moving forward. And that there are a lot of program requirements and that can be excessive and so people weren't too happy about that. But on the flip side, people were really happy about the format of our meetings, that it was available and the recordings could be accessed later and that it was a web conference where people can attend from their desks and not have to travel across campus and miss the meetings. Um, so, and also that we provide um, the, the different resources, such as a checklist and the website and just even this meeting in general, and that the people who are presenting on the web conference did have some pretty good presenter skills. So, um, so that's kind of what people liked and did not like. And again, we'll use this information to improve our program moving forward. And um, then we looked at some of the comments. Now, now there are a lot of comments. I'm not going to go over any specific comments, but we received the majority of our comments were pretty were um, positive. There are a few that were negative in terms that we have to do a bit better in terms of um, um, going over topics that people need as well as um, discussing. I think a, another common theme was that people wanted to talk for us to talk a little bit more about emergencies and what to do in, in helping people know what to do in the event of an emergency, which we're not necessarily focusing on in this program. Although we did do a presentation by Lisa Martin on the emergency program um, a couple of months ago, we certainly can do better about doing that more frequently, more often, and more thoroughly. And then there are some neutral <laughs> comments. And for the most part, and, and again, I'll send this out um, in my next email as a summary, but um, 
For the most part, we did get positive feedback about the program. And this information was presented um, uh, or distributed to our Vice Chancellor for Business and Administrative Services, who um, we were able to get um, further support on continuing this program. So that was something really, really nice that we were able to collect this data and show our effectiveness and um, whether or not we should continue um, doing these things moving forward. So I appreciate those of you who took the time to complete the survey. This is strong data for us to continue the program, strong support, as well as really, really good feedback about the things that we can do to improve and do better and um, just kind of touch base more often on. So that's the summary of our Department of Safety Coordinator Program Evaluation. And what I will do again is to send this out in the next email as an attachment. Along with a, um, a copy of the presentation that Amanda Gray had presented that you heard earlier, um, she had changed a couple of slides with more contact information. And so I wanted to make sure that you had the most recent version of the presentation. So in summary, we talked about our previous meetings uh, as well as um, records management, which is an IIPP responsibility. Amanda Gray presented environmental programs and Bayway 2 presented abrasions and bites. We went over latest news around the campus, next Campus Safety Committee meeting, our evaluation um, survey that there, we, there is now a report on, and our meeting change for June to June 11th. With that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to anybody who might have any questions. So if you're ready, go ahead and ask your question, and we will try our best to respond. Does anybody have any questions for us today? And that actually, I have another thing I need to talk about. Sure. Um, okay. In January this year, uh, Kyosha changed uh, their posting on access to medical and exposure record. If you employee use hazardous chemicals, we need to have this updated poster at you um, area. Um, the major change for the poster actually is just, um, you know, the safety data sheet part used to be called material safety data sheet. Because of the implementation of a, a global harmonization system, the, the terminology change. So that's the major change and also some cosmetic change. Um, once you that email the um, presentation out um, later, and I would like to have this one as attachment to everyone as well. Thank you, Beiwei. So we'll make sure we have the updated poster in the email later on. And perhaps I'll link it on our website so that people have an easy way to get to it in the future. Thanks, Beiwei. Does anybody have any further comments, questions, or concerns? Okay, if not, then we are going to go ahead and wrap up and finish our meeting. Thank you. That concludes our Department Safety Coordinator meeting for May. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.